There was a night in the not so distant past when the whole world was gripped with fear about a possible apocalypse. The day was December 31st, 1999. Some of you here this morning weren't even born. Some of you were so young you could not remember. But it was a night on which the world was gripped with fear. I remember it clearly. You say that's because it's your birthday, Pastor Bill, and that's true. It is my birthday. But I remember it for a different reason. I wonder how many people here remember why the world was so afraid on the evening of December 31st, 1999. It was because of the so-called Y2K crisis. And there was widespread speculation that on January 1st, 2000, there would be widespread computer malfunction because computer programs would not be able to adjust to this new date, 2000. And there was speculation that essential components of the infrastructures in society would malfunction, that power would go out across the world, and that planes would drop out of the sky. I was pastoring in Grand Prairie, Alberta at the time, and we had a gentleman in our congregation who took all of these speculations very seriously, and he actually constructed a bunker on his property and stockpiled food. My own attempt to prepare for this possible apocalypse was quite, I was going to say modest, but I think pathetic is the right word, because all I did was fill the bathtub with water. And to be honest, I wasn't really worried about the apocalypse happen happening, that this Y2K crisis was really going to materialize. Why not? Because I had seen the future. Now, the boys and girls in church are saying, wow, among Pastor Bill's superpowers is the ability to travel in time. Actually, I don't have the ability to travel in time, but I can see the future in this sense that I watched the evening news on December 31st and saw what was happening on the morning of January 1st in places like China and Australia and the other part of the world. And I thought to myself, well, if the Y2K crisis didn't materialize on January the 1st in China and Australia, it wasn't going to materialize in Canada. I could see the future. I want to take this opportunity this morning to make a very grim prediction about each and every one of you. And now, of course, you're all thankful you came to church this morning, right? My grim prediction for each and every one of you, without exception, is that you are all going to die. If the Lord Jesus does not return, you are all going to die. Don't you find that the death rate is brutal? Very, very high. Everyone who is born dies is a sense in which we're all ready to die now. If you are an adult, and you have adult teeth, your teeth are beginning to rot and they'll never get better. You can get fillings put in cavities, I suppose. But we're all going to die. I'm not afraid. This morning, you should not be afraid. Why should we not be afraid? Because we can see the future. How can we see the future? We can see the future and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Because God promised in the scriptures that at the culmination of history, when the new creation is finally launched, God would raise the dead. And God took that future and he thrust it into the present so that we could see and know about the resurrection in the present. A preview of the final resurrection, the future thrust into the present. 
You see, on Good Friday, we remember that Jesus died. We remember the death of Jesus. But on Easter, we celebrate the death of death. Now, if you think, well, that's a very cute way of putting it, Pastor Bill, I saw it on a Facebook meme. Or as an acquaintance of mine says, a Facebook meme. On Good Friday, we remember the death of Jesus. On Easter, we celebrate the death of death because at Easter, the new creation is launched in the person of Jesus who was crucified, who had died, and is now risen. And the promise that the Bible makes and the promise that God makes through the Bible is that if you are joined to Jesus through faith, you will be raised. The future has happened in Jesus. Now, it's a very ancient tradition in the Christian church, going back already to the early centuries, to have baptisms and professions of faith, sometimes called confirmations, will come to church on Easter Sunday morning, and we're honoring that tradition of blessings this morning. And it's so appropriate, because baptism, we learn from the scriptures, this is Romans 6, of course, baptism is a symbol of dying with Christ and rising with Christ. And profession of faith is about a pledge, perhaps a renewed pledge, to die to oneself and to live for Christ in newness. Well, this morning, I'm not going to preach for very long. You'll be grateful to hear. We're going to look at the opening verses of John chapter 20, the account of the resurrection from the dead, the, the vacating of the empty tomb. And we're going to look at two things, if you're keeping notes. First of all, we're going to see the evidence from the tomb, and then secondly, the explanation from the word. The evidence in the open tomb, the explanation in the open word. Well, how does the story begin? It begins with Mary Magdalene getting up early, going to the tomb. We know from other accounts that she was accompanied by other women, but Jesus and Mary Magdalene, you remember, had a special relationship. Because earlier in her history, Jesus had cast out of Mary Magdalene seven demons, and from that moment, she was devoted to him. Never wanted to leave his side. She was among the women that was at the foot of the cross on Good Friday when Jesus was crucified. She felt powerless in that moment. She wanted to do something for Jesus, and she couldn't. And now it's Sunday morning, and Mary rises early because she recognizes that now she has the opportunity to do something for Jesus. She can, she can care for his body, his dead body. She goes to the tomb. She discovers that the stone has been rolled away. And she scurries back to Jerusalem. There's all kinds of running back and forth in this account. She scurries back to Jerusalem. She finds the disciples, locates Peter and John in particular. Now what does she say? She says, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. You can hear the urgency, the despair in her voice. And so Simon Peter and John right away jet off for the tomb. John outruns Peter, stands in the entryway. It's probably a cave that had a burial chamber. Steps into the cave. It's at the twilight of dawn. Sees the linen clothes, the grave clothes which had been drenched in myrrh, probably retained the shape of the body of Jesus, thinks that Jesus is still there and doesn't proceed to go in any further. Peter catches up from behind, and in characteristic fashion, he goes right into the burial chamber. He sees the grave clothes, just as John did, but he sees something else. He sees the cloth that had been wrapped around the head of Jesus, also had been drenched in myrrh, also possibly retained the shape of Jesus' head, but it was not where you would expect it to be. It was off to the side, folded and wrapped in a certain way. Peter was shocked to see this. The body of Jesus is gone. The grave clothes are empty. Now the Jewish leaders would claim that the disciples stole the body of Jesus. Mary 
has concluded that somebody has moved the body of Jesus, but no one could move or um, take a body out of its grave clothes without tearing them to pieces. In fact, if one were to move a body, why would one take the grave clothes off and just take the body? But it would have been possible to take the body out of the grave clothes without shredding them, without ripping them to pieces. You have to recall the scene when Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead. He called Lazarus to come forth, and then Lazarus came forth with the, the grave clothes tightly wrapped around his body, the, the cloth wrapped around his head. And Jesus said to the crowd, unwrap him, unbind him, and let him go. He couldn't do it himself. And so they had to take the time of winding the clothes so he could be he could be free. Here at the tomb of Jesus, the grave clothes aren't tattered or shredded to pieces, they're just lying there. And Peter must have looked very bewildered and confused. John sees it, and he rushes into the tomb and he sees what Peter sees. The grave clothes, the cloth wrapped around the head, off to the side. The text says he believes. A spark of faith is ignited in the heart of John. The tomb of Jesus hasn't been disturbed. It's been deserted. Jesus has vacated the tomb and he's left his grave clothes. Why does John tell us the story of the empty tomb? Well, he wants us to know that when he saw Jesus later in the day, he wasn't hallucinating. Because he had been in the empty tomb first. He had seen that the empty tomb was vacated. He had seen the grave clothes there without the body of Jesus. Both he and Peter testified to it. You see, there are certain facts about Easter that everyone must concede, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, whether you're a skeptic or a cynic, an agnostic, an atheist, or the strongest professing Christian believer. There are certain facts everyone must acknowledge, and one is that the tomb was empty. It's something that's attested to by multiple independent witnesses. We must also grant that People saw Jesus later that day. They saw Jesus after he had died again. There are multiple independent witnesses that say they saw the risen Jesus. There are, of course, many people in the world today who say, well, the story's fabricated, right? But it's highly unlikely that the story was fabricated based on the way that it's written. The first people to see the empty tomb were women. The first witnesses were women. And you know that in the ancient world, women were not permitted to be witnesses in court. They did not have legal status. It would have been an embarrassing fact to say that women were the first to see the empty tomb. But aside from this, how do we account for the fact that the disciples came to believe so strongly and the resurrection of Jesus, that they were willing to die for it. That's the real question that needs to be answered. How could the disciples come to believe so strongly in the resurrection of Jesus that they were willing to die for it? Because the view that was popular among the Jews in that day is that there would be a Messiah who would come and who would triumph over the enemies. But Jesus didn't triumph over the enemies. He was, in fact, crucified by the Jews. And the Jews believed that there would be a resurrection, but only at the end of history. The disciples were claiming that there was a resurrection that occurred in the middle of history. What explanation could there be for the disciples coming to such a strong conviction about the resurrection of Jesus that they were willing to die for it unless Jesus did, in fact, rise from the dead? Here's the point I want to make. Faith isn't a blind leap into darkness. And the seven individuals who stand before us, or who are seated before us this morning, aren't closing their eyes to the evidence. They're believing the evidence. They're accepting the evidence. 
Peter and John didn't go to the empty tomb expecting to find the risen Savior. They went there in grief. They went there in fear. But they left amazed. Because the tomb had not been deserved, disturbed, but it had been deserted. Jesus wasn't there. But we discover, secondly and finally, that Peter and John need more than the evidence. They need an explanation. They needed help putting the evidence together, and so we're told that they moved from the empty tomb to the open Bible. Verse 9, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Peter or John, I should say, here is accusing himself, isn't he? He's saying, Peter and I didn't know that the resurrection was necessary. But God had prophesied of the resurrection of Jesus. And Peter would eventually come to know this because on the day of Pentecost, 50 days later, you remember how he spoke to the crowds in Jerusalem, and he quoted Psalm 16, where David says, For he will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. And then Peter speaks to the crowds, and he says, David, when he wrote Psalm 16, was speaking of the resurrection of Christ. By itself, the empty tomb was rather puzzling. But in the light of Scripture, it all made sense. The resurrection of Jesus wasn't simply something that happened. It was something that had to happen. What would the world be like? What would life be like if Jesus had not been raised from the empty tomb? Well, it would mean that death still had power in the world. It would mean that we would have no hope in the world. It would mean that we would all just die in our sins. It would mean that this life, so fraught with pain, so fraught with difficulty, is all that there is. But it's Sunday morning, the first day of the week, and the new creation begins to blossom. And if you were here on Good Friday, you recall that I said that in the Gospel of John, the motif of the new creation is very prominent. It begins with the words of Genesis, in the beginning was the Word. And Jesus, when he died on the cross on Good Friday, the sixth day of the week, said, it is finished, and he rested. Just as God rested after six days of creation, so Jesus rested after completing the work of redemption. And in the Gospel of John, he, as he rests in the tomb, is rest enjoying Sabbath rest. But now it's the first day of the week, the day after the Sabbath, and it's the start of God's new world. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. Jesus tells us verse 10, sorry, John tells us verse 10, then the disciples went back to their homes, and we know what happened next. They would meet up with Jesus, the risen Jesus would greet them, breathe on them with his spirit, empower them, and equip them to be agents of the new creation and to proclaim the good news of his resurrection throughout the world. The new creation has been launched in the resurrection of Jesus, but God wants us to be part of it. He wants us to be agents of the new creation. He wants us to leave the old world behind. He wants us to walk into the new world. He wants us to use the language that Paul uses in Colossians 3, to put off the old self, to put on the new self, to put off the old ways of living, angry behavior, sexual immorality, deceitful speech. Put off the old creation, Make the new creation evident in how you live now. 
Easter is good news for the whole world, but they must start at home. And each of these individuals this morning who has professed faith is saying, I am an Easter person. I am a new person in Christ. And I want my newness to be evident in the way that I talk. And I want my newness to be evident in the way that I walk. And I want to use all of my energies to spread this newness throughout the whole world and to bring peace wherever I encounter conflict, to bring love wherever I encounter hate, to bring harmony wherever I find parties estranged from each other, to bring healing wherever I find brokenness, to bring companionship wherever I find loneliness, to bring hope wherever I find despair, to look at what the new world will look like, to see the new creation, and then bring it into the present and start to live like that right now. Agents of the new creation. What he said, can there be people in the face of death? We need not be afraid because all of those who are joined to Jesus by faith, by resting and relying on him, will be resurrected in the future. How can we be sure? Because we've seen the future. And if Y2K did not materialize in China, it wasn't going to materialize in Canada. And if death could not keep Jesus in the ground, it's not going to keep those who are joined to Jesus in the ground. We've seen the future. And so what we need to do this morning with this, I'll conclude, we need to accept the evidence of the empty tomb, of the post-death appearances of the risen Jesus, attested to by multiple independent sources. We need to accept the evidence of the empty tomb. We need to believe the explanation of the open word. That this is the only way humanity can have hope. The only way in which the problems of humanity can be resolved. By Jesus dying, and not just dying, but by rising from the dead to launch this new creation that we all yearn for. Let's pray together. Loving God, we thank you for sending us your Son. We're thankful this morning that your Son embraced his mission. And that after he had died, you rose him from the dead. You raised him from the dead to initiate the new world. Help us to show that we're part of the new world. Deliver us from all of those kinds of behaviors that look like the old world. Help us to be agents of the new creation, recognizing that we don't need to rely on our resources. In fact, if we do, we discover that we don't have any. Help us to rely on the resources of the risen Christ who indwells us. Supply us with faith to trust you when you tell us things. Supply us with humility to accept the evidence. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.